Hello, everybody. Barry Johns here, and this is Studio Talk. I get this question a lot, and the question is, what camera do you use to record your channel? Uh, let me say this before I get into that. Uh, I take that as a huge compliment, and I truly appreciate it. I've worked hard to learn how to, how to do all of this, and I've made so many mistakes. Uh, I only started with a camera about two years ago, and I knew absolutely nothing, and so I had to learn from scratch, and it was not easy. I made a ton of mistakes. I still have no idea how to take a good picture, so don't ask me about photography. I don't know. So again, thank you for that, that, that question because I'm taking that as a compliment. So let's get to the question. So as far as camera goes, I think that's, that's probably the most misunderstood question that people who don't know any better, and it was certainly my question in the beginning too, so it's an obvious question, right? Uh, and that is, what camera do you use to get that quality? And I'm here to tell you that that is one of the least important things, uh, not the least, but it's nowhere near as important as a couple of other things that I would put well before a camera. Uh, the number one most important uh, thing in your, uh, in your recording and the quality of it is the quality of your lens, uh, what photographers call glass, which is kind of obvious, right? And, and so it's kind of like the difference between looking through, uh, you know, a, a, a hazy windshield and a freshly clean windshield. It's so much clearer when it's freshly clean when you're driving down the road. Um, that only gets magnified times 10 or even greater when you're talking about camera lenses. I made so many mistakes. I bought so many inexpensive lenses and, and some of them served me fairly well, but it's like anything else. Once you get to a certain quality of lens, you can appreciate uh, the lens a thousand times more, you know. Um, and so as far as cameras go, that's kind of like splitting hairs between conversion, right? Just about any camera you buy today, uh, that's, let's call it a semi-pro camera, right? And, and so just about any camera you buy today is going to be able to record 4K or higher, all right? So let's get that out of the way. The sensors on most of these cameras, one is not necessarily that much better, especially for videography, than the other. So it's really about pairing it with the light, right lens. So when I started my channel, I used a Sony a7 III. And you can see that right here uh, in this example right here. Now this a7 III is, in, is put inside what's called a cage. And in that cage, it's just kind of a way of protecting it. You've got all these, you know, various screw holes of different sizes all over it for mounting various pieces of gear. And so that's what I used for the longest time. Uh, and, and the only reason I bought the camera that I'm filming this on right now, which is a Sony a7 IV, is I film myself. Uh, I don't have any, I don't have a camera operator. It's just me back there. And so the a7 III does not have video eye focus, auto eye focus, whereas the a7 IV does. And so that's why I bought the camera. As far as quality, when it comes to the end result, I mean, you'd be splitting hairs, almost like the difference in, uh, you know, an $800 interface conversion and a $1,200 interface conversion. You're splitting hairs. There's not going to be much of a difference. And for those that really hear it, you know, um, that, that takes a well, well, well-trained ear if you can hear it at all. So I didn't gain any, any quality per se. Now, if I was shooting outside of this very controlled environment, that would be different if I'm going inside, outside, doing other things because the a7 IV records, can record 4K video at 10 bit, whereas the Sony a7 III can only do it 8 bit. Now that's internal, right? Now both of them you can record to an external monitor like a, a Ninja Atomos, which I have here as my monitor, uh, and you can capture that 10 bit over HDMI on the Sony a7 III. But at the end of the day, it just doesn't make that much difference. As to lenses, uh, I use two lenses. The, 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 this lens right now is a Sigma 40 millimeter prime lens. And if you're not familiar what a prime lens is, is a prime lens is basically not a zoom. It's not a zoom lens. So it, it's just, it's got one focal point and focal point is basically the distance, right? If I wanna bring this in, I've either gotta move closer to the camera or bring the camera closer to me. Um, and so that's basically a prime. What a prime enables you to do is to get a lower aperture. Now, I brought this aperture up from what I normally do, which is why you see the background a little bit more in clarity today. Uh, I did that for the purposes of this video. 
But when you, when you see a video and you see the subject like me in the forefront, almost like a three-dimensional kind of thing, where it's separated from the background and the background's kind of blurry effect, um, that's what you get by, by lowering your aperture, which basically means you're allowing that lens to be wide open, okay? And so... And, you know, we all know that cameras have this thing that circles up, and as it closes right, it's kind of like you squint your eyes, um, it's going to close, and it's going to enable you to focus in a little bit better and see things at a distance clearer, but you're going to lose some light as a result of that. So if I wanted this to be wide, you know, for example, you see everything like you would the cell phone, cell phone video, that I would want to up that aperture probably to 8, 9, 10, or even higher, and then everything would be at 100% focus. But if I did that, I'd really have to crank up the lighting in this room to compensate for that. So that's what a prime lens does. On this Sony a7 III, now I go back and forth depending on what I'm trying to do, but like this Sony a7 III is an example, I've got a Sigma 24 to 70. And and so that 24 to 70 basically means it goes between a 24 millimeter focal range and a 70, okay? And so obviously 24 is really wide shot, 70 is really narrow. So the further away you zoom in, zoom out. I mean, it's basic stuff that I think just about anybody would understand. But when you get a zoom lens, they come with a compromise, which means the lowest aperture they can go to is higher than a Prime's. As an example, I believe that Sigma uh, 40 millimeter goes down to 1.4, whereas uh, uh, the Sigma 24 to 70, as with most Prime's, uh, the lowest it'll go is a 2.8. And so both of them are phenomenal. I mean, absolutely phenomenal lenses. If you're just starting from scratch, right, and you really, really want to take this serious, let me say first and foremost, camera gear holds its value. Lenses will hold their value even longer, okay, because it's not digital. So you really don't lose that much by having turn around and selling it later. So the key to that is get a wait for a really good sale. But I started out with the Sigma 16 to 35. Uh, you know, I, I I played around with some lesser expensive, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rokinon and uh, Sam Yang, those kinds of lenses. Which, which are actually very good for the price, um, but they're not going to be at this level. So this particular lens, I think I paid $800, $799 on sale. I think it's normally $1199, um, and that's the 40 millimeter. And then the, um, uh, the, 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 the 24 to 70 is roughly the same. It was the same ballpark. So if you wait for it to get on sale, you can save a lot of money. So like most of you who do this studio thing, which is I assume what brought you here, uh, you understand to get quality is going to require an investment. So that's some of the things that it takes. Now, the next most important thing, do you think I'm going to say camera? I'm not. I'm not going to say camera. Uh, the next most important thing is your lighting, okay? That is absolutely critical. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to get super expensive lighting, but you need good lighting, a balance to get different things. For example, if I look above me into my ceiling, uh, I, I went to, to Lowe's and bought some, um, some galvanized pipe with some flanges that I wanted to screw on type on one side and the other and uh, just loose so they didn't turn on me right when I, when I secured something to it. And I created a grid in my ceiling um, so that I could get all the light and it used to be on stands and took up a ton of real estate in this relatively small space. And so all my lighting and everything is up above me. Now, when you're looking at this particular space, and there is no one-size-fits-all, I am constantly playing around with lighting, which is why back over there, I've got a DMX controller that enables me to move things around, and those are relatively inexpensive. Most of you in music know what a DMX controller is for playing live and connecting your lighting up to that. But, um, you know, I've got two LED soft boxes up in the ceiling pointing back at me that sometimes are on or sometimes are off. These are actually really quite low right now. Uh, then back over there, the color and everything, those are just typical. Uh, I think I bought them at Guitar Center, you know, just typical, you know, colored L uh, L L L whatever the crap you – LED, sorry. Uh, LED, color LED lights, Parkan lights that are back over there giving the color in the background. Of course, you can change color with that because they're LED or RGB. I think that's what you call it. Uh, so that's kind of back there. That's all a personal choice. There's a lot of different ways to going about doing that. But creating the atmosphere is, is, is important. Again, 
I'm always playing with it. Uh, and so that that's probably something I'll never stop toying with. Um, but the most important light, where you want to spend a little bit more money, is what's called your key light. Now, that's right up there, okay? And that's a 36-inch dome soft, do soft box. Uh, and that's super, super important. What the soft box does you is it basically puts... Um, a white sheet, for, for lack of better terms, uh, in the front of it to really smooth out that lighting so it's not harsh. That's really important. That, is, that particular light is where you probably want to invest some more money. Now, you don't need to go as, as, as expensive as I went with this one, but it is well worth the money. I can tell you that worth every penny. I have um, an Aperture 120D Mark II uh, and, and then a light zoom softbox attached to it. And so, so that is probably the most, if you watch any other videography channels or anything like that and they talk about the key light, that is used almost by everybody and there's a reason. It's really, really good. And I think the, the core light with the, with the power source, I believe somewhere when I bought it was around $800 in the soft box, another two, two twenty-five. dollars put that on there. So, you know, you're going to be roughly $1,000 for your light. I mean, that will make a huge, huge, huge difference in the quality of your lighting in the room. Again, these others up here are relatively inexpensive lighting. You know, um, you, can, you can actually do some pretty cheap stuff. One of the things I recommend if you're inside in a small space, you want to get LED. You don't want to do anything like the really inexpensive stuff has bulbs and everything in it. And you really don't want to get into that um, because it just adds a ton of heat into your space. Now, I live in central Florida where the AC is on 10 and a half, 12, 11 months out of the year. And so heat in this space, obviously, with all of this gear and everything is super important to me. Uh, so I want to avoid that as much as possible. So, um, so you really want to get LED if you can. But if you're in a, you know, a fairly soft climate zone, don't worry about it. Just put it up there and get, to, get the cheaper ones. Um, now, uh, the next most important thing, and no, 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 it's not the camera just yet. And, 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 and this is where you can clearly go back to the beginning of this channel and listen to my audio. Yeah, I'm going to say microphone, okay? Uh, you can listen to the audio. Uh, it is nowhere near as good as it is today. And I'm still to this day not satisfied with the audio I get. Um, you know, I, I'm a perfectionist and I'm always wanting to do it better. And so I have toyed around. Um, I have bought a lot of lesser expensive microphones that when I was outside, you know, shotgun microphones as an example, right? Um, one of the first inexpensive mics uh, I got was a video mic pro, which is like a $200 mic, you, a shotgun mic you put on top of your camera. Next, I went with the Rode NTG4. I think it's a 4 Plus or something like that. Uh, I went to that particular microphone. And when I was shooting outside, because I, I did another YouTube channel before this that was primarily shot outside, and and this was a really great microphone. You really, I mean, the differences between this and a more expensive one started to quickly narrow. Uh, but indoors, it's a totally different animal altogether. And... Um, so the next, you know, I, when I first decided that I need to bump up again, I wasn't satisfied with my audio. So I invested some money and I bought a, you know, a, a Sennheiser shotgun microphone. Um, that is the, let's see, uh, MKH 418 or 416. Okay. And that's about an $1,100 shotgun microphone. This is probably the most popular and most used shotgun mic by professionals out in the field. Uh, when recording audio. Uh, it's highly rated and highly recommended, and it is out freaking standing outside. I noticed a huge difference going from the road to that when I was recording outside. Now, uh, since I'm inside, a shotgun microphone doesn't actually help you that much, you know, because it's designed to deflect, you know, ambient sounds and wind and other things like that. Inside here, it's not. So then what I'm recording through right here is a Sennheiser MKH-50. Uh, I believe that's what it's called. 
Sorry for that little edit, real quick. I got stumped on the on the on the particular uh, model number, but it's a Sam, Sam he- Sennheiser uh, M50 or MK50. Uh, uh, there's a link coming up on the page for it. Um, where I got this, the idea for this one is I thought Gerald Undone always did a really really good job with his audio. Uh, he does camera and video gear review. I'll come back to him in a second. Uh, but this is a mic he uses, so I decided to give it a shot. And man, did it make a difference. It made a difference. So I'm actually going to be selling that Sennheiser pretty soon um, because I, I I only use this now. And so I love this particular microphone. It's actually going through uh, a Rupert Neve uh, 511 Mic Pre, uh, 500 series Mic Pre. That's what I'm recording this through, but I'm constantly changing that. That's what it's recording through today. I kind of toy around with that. Remember, for doing voiceover stuff, you want a relatively clean. You don't want to. You don't really want a lot of character for that. And that one's actually giving me character, so I probably shouldn't be using it. But anyway, so I'm doing that. Okay. Then next is your camera. Okay. That that really. Now all these are important. I don't want to make it seem like there's a huge discrepancy between these, but without a doubt, lens and lighting are the most critical ones. Next up, without good audio, forget about it. Again, go back to my beginning of my channel, and you're going to see audio has gone through a lot of things. Now, some of that has to do with YouTube compression about, you know, uh, 14 LUFS, uh, which I didn't understand back then, um, but I do now, and I'm, I'm still trying to work that out exactly, but um, uh, to get that right balance and everything in there, but that's a different discussion. Uh, so, you know, and then of course, you know, the camera and the microphone are super important. Can you do it with a lesser expensive microphone? Sure, you can. Is there going to be a huge difference? Um, I wouldn't say huge. I think very noticeable, especially with uh, being able to be able to, able to get ambient sounds out. Because keep in mind, what you're hearing right now is not the microphone straight out. U- ultimately, uh, the finishing product, like anything else, is done in post. And I will do a separate video at some point showing you what I do at post and the difference it makes uh, before and after as I add each particular plugin in line uh, to get the finished product, okay? So so that gets the audio. So those things are the things that are super important. Other things are just, um, you know, add-ons, nice things to have, but not critical important, like, like the Atomos Ninja 5, which is a 4K monitor that I can see myself. Again, I'm a one-man show here. And so I can see myself to check out framing and all of that stuff and exposure. Um, but a simple 4K monitor is more than sufficient. Even a 1080p monitor that you can buy for $125, $150 on Amazon will get the job done. So you can do that. So that's kind of what I do here in the studio. That's how I record these videos. Again, I go back and forth between the two Sigma lenses. Typically, the a7 III is if I'm over there at the desk and I'm shooting back towards this side of the room. Uh, that's the a7 III, so I don't have to move. That's a luxury. I probably should sell that camera because I really don't use it that often. Lastly, if there's something you need to do, let's say, for example, you're recording in a space um, that doesn't have the background. Maybe it's completely unrelated to studio stuff. I think if you're doing studio stuff, you need to have the real deal behind you. But I could easily just snap a picture of what's behind me, okay? And I did have to do that for a couple of videos when I was gutting this whole space, and I just used that as my background, and then I did a green screen behind me. Green screen is one of those things, once you understand it, it's a piece of cake. I, you, most people make the mistake of overanalyzing it and too much and then, and then sitting too close, having the green screen too close to the body. You need that separation so you don't get that washback of green fringe in your hair and things like that. Now... I don't have any hair, so I don't have that problem. Uh, but but anyway, you kind of get you get what I'm saying. So hopefully you find this interesting and 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 it answers the question. I think from now on when I get that question, I'll just post a link to this particular video so that people can see it and understand it. So again, this is kind of a filler video. This is not for everybody, but for those who are interested, that's here. If you like the things I talk about on this channel, hit that like, subscribe, and that notification bell. You know, join the community here. Help me grow the channel. I work hard for you folks, and I really appreciate it. But until next time, I hope every one of you have a great day. Bye-bye.